Good morning, Central Baptist. As I begin to read the announcements, please let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. Do we have any visitors with us this morning? If so, we'd like to welcome you. Could you just raise your hand if you're a visitor? Good morning. We'd like to welcome We'd like to welcome you and everyone here in the most holy and precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're glad that you're here with us this morning at Central Baptist. This Saturday, September the 18th at 8.30 a.m., men, we're having a men's conference. We hope to see you all there. If you have not signed up yet, feel free to call the church office and give me your name and Pastor Cal and I will sign you up when, you, when he gets back. Again, it's this Saturday at 8.30 a.m. to noon, and there will be a continental breakfast. So this is a great time for you men to get together and worship, and also worship with each other and worship with the Lord. This coming Sunday is our Rally Sunday, Adult studies will begin again at 9 a.m. The adult class is a study on Moses. The class will be held, is Meredith here? Is it in Fellowship Hall or is it in the parlor? Does anyone know? Where's the class, Steve? It's in the, it's in the chapel? Oh, okay, it's on the third floor. Okay, the class on Moses will be held on the third floor and the educational level. After service on the 19th, please stay and join us in our Back to Church barbecue. There is a sign-up sheet as you exit the fellowship hall downstairs. Please sign up so we can have a head count so we know how much food to prepare. Also, let us know whether you're bringing a salad or dessert to share. Our youth group will resume on Wednesday the 29th at 5.30. So all of our youth, please plan to attend and invite your friends. As we begin our service, please again, prepare your hearts and your minds for worship. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to Woman's Laity Sunday. Our call to worship this morning is going to be taken from Psalms chapter 27, verse 1. It disappeared on me here. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? If you'll join me now, we're going to have, do an invocation, and then we'll do the Lord's Prayer. Oh, dear Father, 
Thank you. Thank you for letting us meet here today. I thank you, dear Lord, for the promises you have made us. First and foremost, your promise of unconditional love, dear Lord. We thank you for the promise that wherever we are, you will be there also. We thank you for the promise that there is nothing we can't handle when you are by our side. Thank you for the peace that follows, knowing we are not alone. Thank you for the peace of knowing you are protecting our loved ones, even when we can't be with them. Please give us the strength and the courage to love you, to trust you, and to rely on you. Thank you, Jesus. We pray in the words you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, if you'll join us, please, in the opening hymn, it will be on the screen, God Will Make a Way. If you're able, please stand.
has ever sung this song before. <laughs> Nobody has ever sung this song before. Lynn has never played it. So we actually, in this church, we really do sing a lot better than that. <laughs> I am so sorry. I just love the words of that song because he always makes a way. Thank you. I hope that you, like me, were following the words on that. And it's amazing. And it's amazing to me is because it said he will find a way. He'll find a way in a different way. And we are having a different way this morning. We're having Women's Sunday. We're coming together in faith, and we hope that the Lord will have you hear what he would want you to know. When I was asked to give my testimony this morning, I had to do some real soul searching. I grew up knowing Jesus. I had two sisters and one brother and a mother and father who took good care of me and loved me very much. My oldest sister, whom I lost two years ago, has always been a beacon of faith and the love of Jesus Christ and has helped us all so much to love and trust Jesus. But there have been some times in my life that God made it absolutely clear to me that he was there taking care of me and leading me. I'd like to share one of those experiences with you now. Seven years ago, my husband and I were vacationing in Lake Tahoe. We had been there for four days, having an absolutely wonderful time. On Tuesday, July 30th, we decided to take a car ride to the other end of the lake. We started out, Henry was driving, and I noticed him rubbing his chest a little bit. And I said, what's the matter? And he said, oh, it's just burning a little bit. So I said, okay. So we kept going. I see him rubbing his chest some more. I said, it still hurts? And he said yes, and we both promptly decided it had to be the pastrami sandwich that he had eaten the night before, that it was just heartburn. We proceeded to our destination, and by the time we got there, he said, you know, I think I'm going to see if there's a medic here. I thought, okay, maybe this isn't heartburn. There was no medic there, but they directed us to an emergency room that was a block away. We got in the car, I drove him over there. He got out of the car, and we entered the room. He had the insurance card in his hand. We walked in, and there was nobody in this emergency room. A nurse was there, and she said, hi, what's your name? What can I do for you? And he said, well, my name's Henry, and he said, I just have this burning in my chest. She said, okay, come with me. He said, don't you want my insurance card? And she goes, we'll do that later. She takes him into a room, and I thought, wow, somebody who cares more about symptoms than getting paid? You know, this is unique. So they took us into an examining room, and the doctor was there. She took a listen to his heart, and she immediately ordered an EKG. It was when the nurse literally ran out of the examining room after the EKG that I realized we were in trouble. The, nurse came, the doctor came back immediately. She gave him nitroglycerin under his tongue, and she said, I think there's something going on. Well, within 20 minutes of our arrival at that emergency room, we were in an Henry was in an ambulance heading towards Reno, and I was following him in the car. Reno is 50 miles away. It was a long time to think and pray and become fearful of what was going to happen when we got there. Then it was amazing. We get there, and just as we go to take the last exit off the highway, I look up, and there is this huge billboard, and it's got one word printed across the front of it, and it says, Jesus. And underneath it, it says, I will trust in you. And I said, wow, God, how did you know I needed some reassurance? I could feel his presence. I knew he was with me. I said, okay, Lord, this is up to you. I am out of my league here. This is up to you. When I parked, they were getting Henry out of the ambulance on the stretcher, and we took him into the emergency room there. The doctors examined him. He looked at him and he said, you know, I feel pretty good. And the doctor looked at me and he said, well, you look pretty good. He said, I could actually let you go. And he says, but remember, that doctor gave you nitroglycerin. So Henry looked at me and said, do you think there's something there? And he said, yes, I do. So he said, well, then I'm not going anywhere. So the doctors ordered an angiogram. They took Henry out. And as the doctor walked by me, I said, do you really think there's something there? And he says, I'm 90% sure. He said, we'll do the angiogram. We may have to place a stint. He said, I'll be back to talk to you in about 45 minutes. Well, you know what 45 minutes means in a hospital emergency room. 
So I sat and waited and waited, and finally somebody came out and got me and took me into another room and seated me in front of a, a monitor, computer monitor. The doctor sat down next to me. Henry's heart was there on the screen. He looked at one artery, and he said, see this artery? And I said, yes. And he said, that's blocked about 70%. I said, okay. He said, see this artery? I said, yes. He said, I'd say that's closer to 80%. He proceeded through four arteries with varying degrees of blockage. And I finally got the message. And I looked at him, I said, are you talking open heart surgery to me? He then flipped the image over on the screen and he said, do you see this thin white line right here? That's 100% blockage. He said, I've called the surgeon, he's on his way. That was when our angel walked in. And our angel was in the form of a cocky little doctor in Levi jeans and cowboy boots. He introduced himself to me. He said, I'll be up in a few minutes to talk to you. I've scheduled surgery at 6.45 a.m. tomorrow morning. I mean, wow, talk about a whirlwind. They whisked Henry up to the ICU unit there. They had a special cardiac ICU unit that they took him up to. Hooked him up to more gadgets and monitors and alarms than I even knew existed. The doctor came in and proceeded to explain what he was going to do. He would be having five bypasses tomorrow morning. We both listened to everything he had to say, sat there with their shell shocked and said, okay. Once Henry was settled in, I had to call my daughters. And that is not a fun task, especially when they're 1,000 miles away and you're telling them that their father is having open heart surgery tomorrow morning, a father who had never had any heart problems and there was never a hint of any of this happening. When I reached my oldest daughter, she happened to be in the car with her husband, so I was on speakerphone telling them exactly what was going on. And her husband said to me, Mom, what hospital's he in? And it brought me up short. I said, Dave, I don't know. I didn't even know the name of the hospital that we were in. I asked a nurse that was walking by, and she told me the name of it, that it was a renowned medical center. And I told Dave that. And boy, there, if I ever knew I was out of my league, it hit me right in the face. Both of my daughters were mothers with young children. They lived 1,000 miles away. They had jobs, and there was absolutely no way they could make it out there. So I told them that it wasn't necessary, that everything was going to be just fine. The next call I got was from my middle sister, who lived in Washington State. My daughter had called her immediately upon hanging up and explained what was going on. She was calling to tell me that she would be there the next day. It turns out that we were at the renowned medical center in Reno, Nevada. This is a regional hospital that services 250 miles surrounding country. It is phenomenal. The cardiac unit was spectacular. There was even a hotel in this hospital. I could stay in my hotel room and walk directly to Henry's room without even going outside. He said, it never ceases to amaze me that when God is in control, he thinks of everything. The next morning, that Wednesday, Henry underwent bypass surgery. He had five bypasses. When the doctor finally came out and told me everything was all right and that he'd meet us back in the uh, cardiac unit, I said, thank you, God. Praying the whole time he was in there and now to hear these words, that's all a person wants to hear. When he got back into the room and started talking to us about what he had done, we realized that the real miracle, first of all, they bring this man into our lives. When he's talking to us, he said, I want to tell you, he says, I glued, I stapled, and I sewed everything because I don't trust you, he said to my husband. And he said, but the real miracle was because he listened to his body and we got the help promptly, there was no muscle damage to the heart. He didn't have a heart attack. In two days, he was walking the halls with a really cute nurse on his arm. My sister left Sunday. Monday, Henry was discharged from the hospital. We spent the night in the hospital there, right in that same hotel, and we flew home on Tuesday. That Thursday, we had a prearranged appointment with a cardiologist in Westerly, and the first thing he said to us was, I never would have believed you had five bypass surgery a week ago. Of course, a lot of rehab followed. 
And every time Henry still sees Dr. Lana, he says, you should appreciate that doctor and the job that he did for you. We do appreciate it, but what we appreciate more is how well God took care of us. It is still amazing to us how God got us exactly where we needed to be, exactly when we needed to be there, exactly put the right people in our path. Henry got a second lease on life, and I will be eternally grateful to our loving, merciful Heavenly Father for the rest of our years together. Praise be to God. Our responsive reading for today will be Psalm 121. I will say the odd verses and you will say the even verses. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? He will not let your foot slip. He will he watches over you. Who watches over you will not slumber. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. Now and forever. Thank you for the word of the Lord. This is the time. Is this on? Okay. This is the time of the service that we had the opportunity to give back to the Lord um, some of our monetary blessings that He's given to us. And with these monetary blessings, it helps us to come to a place where we can be encouraged and strengthened and, and um, supported in every way. It also helps to be able to reach out, not just for our church family, but people in the community, anybody that's hurting that needs help. And so it's such a blessing for us to be able to spend this time to give a small portion. But you know, as Pastor Cal says all the time, it's not just about our monetary blessings. It's about our time. It's about our caring heart. Like, I have a friend that goes to the nursing home all the time. And she goes into this nursing home, and what she does to these patients who sits in those chairs day in and day out and do not have one person to visit them and probably says to themselves, does God really care for me? Is he really there? And she shows up. And she, this patient sees God in her. It's our acts of kindness, as well as our monetary blessings, how we can really praise God. So now we're going to play the doxology, and I'm going to ask the head usher to come forward. And the doxology will be on the screen. Father God, we offer this offering to you. We ask, Father, that you bless it, that it helps to multiply and bless others. We thank you, Father, that we are an offering to you. All that we have, all that we give, and all that we have, we offer to you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated.
the time that we spend um, in prayer. The wonderful thing I love about Central Baptist is that we are a praying church. We truly care about people. And you know what? One of the greatest things that we can do for anyone is to pray for them. When somebody's hurting or suffering, sometimes they can't even pray for themselves. But as the Holy Spirit puts them on our hearts, we can pray for them. And it's such a blessing to them. And you know, the scripture says that our first prayer should be to pray for all those in authority, all of our political and religious leaders, and even our teachers, because our teachers are the ones that are forming the future of our children. And so we need to keep them in prayer, and that's who we're going to lift up today. We're also going to lift up um, everybody that's on our prayer list. Pastor Cal is so good about mentioning individual names, but knowing me, I'll forget somebody, and I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. So we're going to do a collective prayer for everybody of all the prayers. There's been so many needs and, and so much happening. So um, we're going to pray for all of those. We're going to pray for the other countries that are suffering right now. We're going to pray for all the lonely. We're going to pray for the people that really don't even know God, has no hope, no, no, nothing to look forward to. So I'm going to um, ask if you all would just take one minute and silently pray for somebody that the Holy Spirit is putting on your heart right now. Pray for that person, and after that, I will say a prayer, and then we'll say the community prayer that will be on the screen. Let's pray. Father God, you hear our prayers even before we even say them. You know our needs even before we say them, Father. And you are so faithful. You are so, so faithful and so good to us. So we lift up to you today all the prayers that were just said silently, and we lift up, Father, all those in authority today. Guide them by your Holy Spirit, Father. Convict everybody in the areas that need conviction and affirm them in the areas that need affirmation, Father. I just pray that everybody that's hurting today, everybody is suffering, Father, that somehow they will hear you whispering in their ears that you love them and care for them. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name for everything. Amen. Now we'll read the community prayer and we'll all say it together. Father God, Help us to trust and believe that you hear all of our prayers, knowing that even through our suffering, you work everything out to good. You are a merciful and loving God. Your grace is fresh upon us every day, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I, gotta look and, I have to look and see what we do next. Sorry about that. All right. Now we're going to have the children's moment, and Kathy Burnside is going to give a message to our children, because a lot of them are listening on Facebook also, and a few here. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Good morning, everyone. I have noticed a theme this morning as we have been going through the service, and the theme is faith, so I'd like to share a little story about faith with the children at home and the child here <laughs> and all of you. Uh, first of all, I want you to think about the definition of faith. And If you're a young person, you can Google it. And if you're an older person, you can get Webster's Dictionary out, however you prefer to do it. But the definition, I want you to think about the definition while I'm going through this. Now this is a blindfold. Ta-da. If I put this blindfold on, and I have to walk from here back to the church where Mr. and Mrs. Collins are, I might have a really tough time. In fact, I know I would. I can barely walk through my house without running to a table and bruising my leg. So I can only imagine having a blindfold on. I would run into the piano. I would fall over a pew. I would probably hurt somebody else as I'm walking through. But what if I had somebody to guide me? What if I asked my husband to come up here and said, you know, help me, so 
go from here to there with this blindfold on. I trust him completely to get me through that journey to get me back there without getting hurt. Well, that's the way life is. And sometimes we have journeys that we go through and we don't know what's going to happen. So the person that we trust the most is God. God is with us every minute of the day. And sometimes the journey may not seem like it's going like you want it to, but he's there with you. He's there with you when your first day of school. He's there when you're trying out for the basketball team. He's there when your friends are telling you to jump into the pool for the first time and you know that you can't swim and you might need some help. He's there. So the lesson is not only for young people, but it's for our older generation. Not to forget that faith is very important. And faith is defined as having trust and confidence and having someone guide you and help you. And the Lord is that figure for all of us every day. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, give us faith that is strong and let us trust in you to guide us safely as we live from day to day. Amen. Thank you. Our sermon scripture for today is Joshua 1, verses 1 through 9. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. And as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the Lord depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be, bit with, will be with you wherever you go. Thank you for the word of the Lord. We have been hearing a lot about faith lately. Pastor Cal has been doing amazing sermons. The one that sticks out in my mind the most was what he did in July. And the title of his sermon was, I want to have that kind of faith. And it was based on the story of Abraham and Isaac. And then in August, Phil Bryan gave another wonderful sermon, and it was entitled, Look Up and Live. And that was based on keeping your eyes on Jesus, not allowing Satan to distract you and pull you away. Today, I'm going to be talking about where is your faith? Faith. Faith is such a small word, but it packs quite a punch. Faith is based on belief, trust, and hope in something or someone. And also, if whatever we do on our part, that everything would work out all right. Faith influences our thoughts, our words, our actions, our decisions, and even our attitudes. Think about this. Every time you go to pick a doctor, you're believing, trusting, and hoping that doctor will keep you in good health as long as you do what he asks you to do. When we pick a financial advisor, we believe, we trust, and we hope that he will advise you how to have a strong and secure financial portfolio. Even when we 
pick our spouse or have relationships. We believe, we trust, and we hope that they will be a blessing to us and we'll be a blessing to them. Faith is unbelievable. And the faith really, truly influences a lot in our life. But there's three things that we need. And because we can either put faith in ourself and all the things that the world offers us, like maybe our bank account, maybe our education, maybe our talents, maybe our associations, and we hope and we trust that they will make us happy and peaceful and feel whole and complete. Or we can put our faith in what AA calls your higher power and what the church calls God, Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit. But if we put our faith in them, we have to know something about them. We can't just blindly say, oh, I love God and I'm going to follow him without knowing anything. So there's three things we can do. There's probably more than three, but these are three good ones. The first one is to read this. This is definitely more than just ink on paper or flowery words that were made up by man to make us feel good. This is a history book. It tells us what happened in the past, what's, going to hap what's happening now, and what's going to happen in, in the future. It's filled with, with guidance. It's filled with promise. It's filled with hope and joy. It, it makes us, it tells us what God is like and what his character is like and, and what he means to us and what we should be and what he wants us to be. For instance, in the book of Peter, it says, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares about you. In Philippians, it says that I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In Corinthians, it says that his grace is sufficient, for in our weakness, his power will be made perfect. In Proverbs, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he'll make your path straight. And in Matthew it says, Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and everything else shall be added unto you. It's absolutely amazing what God's word says to us, and that we can lean on that, and it gives us faith. The second thing that we can do is prayer. Prayer is a wonderful line to God. It's, it's like our telephone. We don't just talk in a phone. We listen also. And every time we go to prayer, but every time we are silent in prayer, we feel God's loving arms around us. For God says, be still and know that I am God. My dear friends, it's in the silence that we feel his presence. It's in the silence that we get added faith and hope. It's in the silence that he gives us direction. It's in that silence that we hear his voice. People say to me, God doesn't talk to me. You say he talks to you. And I always say to them, well, do you listen? <laughs> you know, there's an old saying, God has given us one mouth and two ears. So obviously it's very important to God that we listen as well as talk. But what do most of us do? We run to God with our laundry list of needs and wants and then just leave it there. We don't take time to just sit and worship him and, and experience and think about all the things that he has given to us and to be quiet, to listen to him, to familiar your voice to hear his voice speak to you. Because the more you do that, the easier it is to listen. The third thing that um, we can do to have our faith in God and to build a faith, and let me tell you, you're not going to like this one <laughs> because it's about our challenges and our trials. This is why Peter, what James says in, in the book of James, Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you suffer various trials 
for the genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold. Have you ever met some people that are just so full of faith, they live their whole life in the spirit, and they're always so joyful? And you probably say to yourself, sure, they can be like that. They don't have any problems. They're not like me. <laughs> you couldn't be any more wrong. Those are the people that have had so many challenges in their life and so many trials. And the reason why they're like that is because they have seen God come through every single time. Sometimes when they're hanging by the, by the, the thread or their fingertips, God will come wishing and do something so amazing that all they can say is, wow, wow, God, I can't believe that happened. I can't believe you, you could do that. I can't believe it would turn out that way. Have you ever had wow experiences? I'm sure you have. I've had plenty. And we certainly know that Karen had one because her testimony said that. Thank you, Karen. That was wonderful. That was a real faith builder especially when I'm always getting lost <laughs> and I don't have a GPS. But anyway, right now, I would like to take a few minutes out to talk about three people in Scripture in the Old Testament that had wow experiences, and they also um, had faith and trust and belief. The first one is Joshua, and that's what our Scripture reading was today. The book of Joshua opens up with God saying to Joshua, Joshua, be strong and of great courage. Do not be afraid, for I will be with you wherever you go. Well, obviously, when God starts off like that, you know that Joshua is going to have a challenge. And I'm sure he has some trepidation and some fear. Uh, you would, too, because as you know the story, Moses just took the people out of captivity, out of Egypt, uh, God's chosen people, and God promised to bring them to the promised land. So Moses took all these people, and it took a long time. But just as Moses is ready to enter the promised land, Moses dies. And so God asked Joshua to take over. But there was a big problem. The problem was that this land was already taken, and it was being protected by this enormous wall, and it was like a fortress around the city of Jericho. And in order for Joshua and his men to go and seize that property, they'd have to get over that wall. So God says to Joshua, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to take your men and seven priests, and I want you to walk around that city wall for six days. And on the seventh day, I want you to walk around it for seven times and let the priests blow the trumpets and then let everybody shout, but don't shout before the seventh day. Well, if I was Joshua, I would probably say, really, really God, that's your plan. To just blow some trumpets and shout and this massive wall is gonna come down, really? Don't you think it maybe it'd be better to bring some hammers and some sledgehammers and, and I, they probably didn't have bulldozers back then, but. You see why God told him to do something that was completely nonsense to, to Joshua? Because if he told Joshua to, to do something that Joshua might be able to do, then Joshua could take credit for that. He could say, oh yeah, I can do that. Where would his faith, where would his trust, where would his obedience be to do something that seemed so bizarre to him? And where would they have seen the power of God I mean, who could knock down a wall like that by just shouting? But you see, God's ways are not our ways. He can do anything that we can't do. So that's why he asks us to do things like that. And then the second... One minute. Sorry. Um, the second thing that uh, we can do uh, that that uh, is talked about in the Bible is uh, Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah, I love Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the book starts off with God saying to Jeremiah, before I formed you in your mother's womb, before you were born, I called you and set you apart to be a prophet. And Jeremiah says, oh, sovereign Lord, no, that can't be, for I can't speak and I'm only a child. 
And God said to him, don't say you're only a child. I want you to go to everybody I send you to, and I command you to tell them what I want them to hear. And Jeremiah, being a child and, and certainly was afraid, went in obedience and trusted. And for 40 years, my dear friends, he prophesied to those nations. And I have to tell you, of all the prophets, he was one that was not really well liked because his prophecy was not flowery. It was not good. It was really harsh. And in my own words, this is not in the Bible, but in my own words, it's probably like, you know what, guys? You better shape up or else. Because these are the Israelites that God already blessed them, brought them to the promised land, gave them everything. They were starting to follow him, and then all of a sudden, they went back to their old ways, doing their own thing, you know, doing everything that God didn't want them to do. Does that sound, sort of sound familiar to all of us? Do we constantly repeat that? Anyway, the good news is, is that Jeremiah did preach. And he did not have one convert in 40 years. But he didn't care because he did exactly what the father told him to do. He was only to be the messenger and leave the consequences to him. And that's encouraging to us because God tells us to only be the messenger to only share the good news about how much the Lord loves us, how much he cares for us, how much he wants our life. And then some people listen, some people don't, but that's not our job. Our job is only to share the good news. It's not our job to, to convert anybody. That's up to the Holy Spirit and God, not us. So the third person that I wanna talk about is Abraham. And Abraham, good old Abraham, I love Abraham because he was so faithful, so trusting, and so obedient. But he did everything, not out of fear for God, not out to get brownie points from anybody. He did it all because of a great love that he had for his heavenly father. And as you know the story, God asked him to do some very difficult things. The hardest of all was that when... Um, Isaac, his son, was, was born, and he, when he was little, God told Abraham to take Isaac up to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him to him. Now, can you imagine how Abraham felt? Here he's always obeyed God. He's always, he loves God so much, but he also loves Isaac. And this didn't make sense to him. But out of his enormous love, he did it anyway. And as Isaac was, and Abraham was going up the mountain, the, Isaac turned to him and said, Father, we have the matches, we have the, the, the wood, but we don't have the sacrifice. And Abraham turned to him and said, don't, Son, don't worry. God will provide. Sure enough, that's exactly what he did. When Abraham was just ready to sacrifice Isaac, God stopped him and said, Stop. I will provide. And he provided a ram in the thicket, and that's what Abraham used for the sacrifices. But you know what, guys? There is something more to that story. Because back then, Abraham went, uh, and was living in a time where the pagans would sacrifice children to their gods. And even a few uh, Hebrews did that, and God did not want that at all. And so he told Abraham, stop, no more. I will provide. And that's exactly what he did. Many, many, many years later, he came down from heaven in the form of Jesus Christ. And he paid the perfect, perfect, holiest sacrifice for us. Jesus took every single sin and it had to be somebody perfect. And and, he, and so we don't have to add anything to that. There was two things that happened that day. And actually, if you read in Philippians, it talks about Jesus, and it says, even though he was in the form of God, he did not consider himself equality to God, but came down to earth and humbled himself for our sake. And the day that Jesus hung on that cross, two things happened. 
The first thing happened was he was so filled with every single despicable sin that mankind could ever, ever commit. And because he was so filled with sin, his spirit had to leave him because his spirit was perfect. And my dear friends, it wasn't the thorns in his heads or the beating that he got. His worst pain was at that moment. But you know what? Even then, he had to feel what we felt. When we are suffering, we don't think God cares about us, that he's not there. He had to feel our abandonment sometimes. The second thing he said, it is finished. Nothing has to be added to that. No good works, no keeping all the rituals, doing nothing. Because in Ephesians it says, by grace you are saved. It's a free gift from God, not of works, so that no man could boast. See, we could never earn our salvation, ever. Only God, out of his enormous love for us, chose to want to have a relationship with us, so he had to pay the price. So, my dear friends, the next time somebody asks you, where's your faith? Or if you ask yourself that, I want you to say, my faith is an amazing God who can do everything that I could never do. He's always faithful and loves me so much. And all he wants me to do is believe in him, receive this free gift, and trust him and follow him. Let us pray. Father God, words can't express how much we love you, but better yet, how much you love us. You love us unconditionally. Your love never stops, Father. It always surrounds us. We can put our faith and our hope and our trust in you. And Father, it's so easy to follow somebody that loves us that much. So I truly pray, Father, that, that this day, that you will give us an added portion of faith and of hope and of love, that we can carry on and be your ambassadors in this dark world, that we will go where your spirit leads us to go without fear or trepidation. And we thank you that you always make a way and you always work it out for the best. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand now and sing our closing prayer. Here I am, Lord.
Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And I want to quote what Joshua said. Choose this day who you shall serve. But as for me and my household, I choose to serve the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Have a good day.